This webinar was developed to assist you with the process of developing an abstract. Before beginning the assignment, make sure that you review the course requirements and use the headings and word count that are suggested in the assignment. Um, abstract preparation can be difficult, especially if you haven't done this before, so make sure you leave ample time for multiple drafts. This webinar should hopefully give you some tips that will assist you with this process. The purpose of an abstract is really to communicate your scholarship to others um, used in many different areas. And, you know, abstracts are used in a lot of different areas of professional practice. It's a brief summary of your work that you've done, and it really sets the stage for readers. It allows them to know if they want to read more about the article that you're writing or come to a presentation, either oral or poster presentation that you're presenting. Um, it tells them a little bit about it. It may also be used for presentation at scientific conferences. Oftentimes you'll see abstracts published in a book of abstracts. And then it may be used in research proposals. Very often at the beginning of your research proposal, you'll have a short abstract about the um, proposal itself, the beginning of journal manuscripts and book chapters. And those are typically the places that we tend to see abstracts. Abstract development, um, what I mean by looking at the background to conclusions, is typically when you write an abstract, you want to describe your study or whatever it is that you're doing from the beginning of it, why you did it, what you did, to the end of it, you know, what you found, what your conclusions were at the end result of doing this. So the general format that we see for scientific abstracts tends to be these common headings, background, purpose, methods, results, and conclusions. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we include in each of those sections, but in general that's what we tend to see for scientific abstracts. Some tips to improve your abstract, and these are things that I've read over the years and also heard from experts in creating abstracts. When you create your title, very often you want to put your findings in the title rather than just having a description of the project. It makes it a little bit more exciting. You want to capture the reader's attention. Um, you may be trying to get people to come to your poster because you want to describe your research to them. If you are applying for a grant, by putting some of your findings in the title, it can be uh, interesting and capture someone's attention, especially if there's multiple grant applications. Another important uh, tip to help improve the quality of your abstract, and this is one I very often see with beginners, is you want to make sure that you reserve a majority of your text for the methods and results section. For example, if it says that you need to submit a 500 word abstract, you don't want to have 300 words on the background section. Typically the pieces that are going to be most important are the methods section, which again describes the rigor of the study that you're undertaking, and the results, which tends to be what you're adding to the literature that hasn't been known before. What's new and different? What did you find that's different? So. A lot of times when people first do abstracts, the things you're most comfortable are what you're finding in your literature review, and people tend to put a lot of information in the literature review. What I'm suggesting is you really want to do the opposite and put most of your text in the methods and results section. Another tip that can be very helpful is to move important messages to the beginning of the sentence. The other thing uh, that's important to consider is to use tables judiciously. Tables do take up a large amount of word count, and so if you decide to use a table in your abstract, keep in mind that that will take up some of your word count from the text that you may have. But there are cases where sometimes it's better to put a table in, and it's easier than trying to explain the data with text. Another tip that's very important is to know the mission of the organization that you're submitting your work to. So in, in the case of this abstract, you're submitting your work to faculty here at UMass Dartmouth who may be wanting to give you uh, an undergraduate research award, course faculty, honors program faculty, but when you graduate and go to graduate school or even as an undergrad if you submit your abstract somewhere, 
you may be submitting to an organization that has a specific mission and you want to make sure that your abstract considers that mission when you're writing it. And probably the most important point related to writing an abstract is to make sure to follow word and character counts. Very often the website will say it has to be 500 words or 1500 characters. So make sure that you follow those carefully because you could be rejected and sections of your abstract not submitted if it goes over the word count. Generally when you're writing an abstract you want to put everything you want in the abstract first and then edit down to the word count. That's important because important ideas from your work need to be included and you want to make sure that you don't eliminate anything up front that may be very important to include. It may also sometimes you hear is a character count instead of a word count and it may say characters with spaces or without spaces. In the Microsoft Word feature under review very often you can go click on the whole document under the review you can actually get the word count so you know how many words or how many characters. So the next section in the first section that you're going to have in your abstract is your background. And as I said earlier, you're going to keep this short and sweet. Briefly introduce the problem. What is it that you want to study? Um, very often you want to say a little bit about previous research that's been done in the area. And generally you want to try and keep it to two to three sentences maximum. You don't want to use a lot of your word counts on the background. And in this, you want to make sure that you're including what it is that you intend to study. This section very often also includes a theoretical or conceptual framework if that's appropriate to your study. In nursing, one that we commonly use is called the common sense model of illness. And you may just put in a short sentence like I did, the common sense model of illness guides this study. That's all you have to say about it. The other thing you want to consider is including relevant versus general information. This is where knowing your audience is incredibly important to the presentation. If your audience is experts in a particular area, you don't need to give them general information. Instead, you want to get specifically. For example, signs and symptoms of congestion are the most frequent cause for hospitalization in acute heart failure. Everybody who works with these, this population knows this information and that would be considered general information. So you've just wasted a sentence in your very small word count including information for which most of your audience would know that. If however you were talking to a lay audience of economists and you wanted them to give you money, they may need to know this information. So you want to consider your audience. And the last thing that you want to do in the background is describe the gap in knowledge that your project intends to fill. So what is it that you intend to do in your particular study that hasn't been done before? For example, how completely congestion is relieved during hospitalization is unknown in a specific population. So you want to study and sort of figure out, you know, how completely it is relieved. So the next section after the background is going to be the purpose statement and you want to make sure that the purpose statement flows from the background. This is not a time to be introducing new ideas that haven't previously been introduced in the background section. Generally you state your purpose or it may be a hypothesis. Typically it's one direct dense sentence and I did give you examples there that you can see for both a purpose statement and a hypothesis. And the purpose of this study is to describe the outcomes of an exercise counseling intervention in an ethnic minority sample with heart failure. So it's telling you exactly what you're doing, what your outcomes are, and who the population is. The second one is a hypothesis when you have some literature to suggest what relationships might potentially exist. For example, measures of quality care such as weight loss, heart failure teaching, and care by heart failure specialists is associated with a lower rate of 30-day readmission to the hospital. And you can see there what predictors you think are going to be associated with the lower rate of 30-day readmission. The next section in these next two sections are going to be some of your most important sections. 
are the methods and the reason that the methods section is so important is this is where the rigor is evaluated in your study. If you're submitting a grant or you're submitting for publication, the reviewers are going to want to know the quality of your study, how rigorous was this study, and the methods are really going to tell them that. So you want to make sure that you spend adequate time clearly describing this section. So the first thing you'll describe is the design of the study. Was it a qualitative study? Was it a quantitative study? Was it a mixed method study? the population or who you actually plan to study and you want to be as specific as possible. In my work I study hospitalized heart failure patients over the age of 65 so that way others know exactly who it is I study. The intervention if there is one if you did something to this population. Data collection how did you collect the data? Did you do interviews with the people? Did you send them a survey? Did you email them? Did you text message them? How did you collect the data from people? And then the measurement instruments. How did you measure the things that you were actually collecting? So in a quantitative study, you may have a survey they fill out. In a qualitative study, you may in fact just do interviews with them. So you want to describe specifically how you measured your variables and collected your data. Again, and I can't reiterate this enough, reserve a majority of the word count for methods and results. So this is a very important section. This is just an example from my work of a, a method section from an abstract. And I know that some of you are not nurses, so this may be foreign to you, but at least you're able to see in general some of the principles I described. A total of 133 patients with heart failure mean age of 79, 56% male, mean of 3.3 years with heart failure, so you know who they are, completed the 18-item heart failure somatic awareness scale during hospitalization, so you know what instrument I used. Symptom clusters were determined by hierarchical agglomerative clustering techniques in SPSS 20, so you're able to see some of the analysis that I did. Chi-square and ANOVA with post hoc LSD analysis were used to compare differences in age, gender, and length of time with heart failure by three symptom cluster groups. So even if that doesn't make sense to you from a statistical viewpoint, I explained in one dense sentence exactly what I did for statistical analysis so that someone that's evaluating this for submission would be able to evaluate the rigor of what I've done. Uh, the next section is the results section and again this is a very important section because you're describing what it is that you found that may be new or different information from what's been out there before. This is like the groundbreaking what you got from your study. The important thing is to prevent, uh, present relevant data including primary outcomes and any secondary outcomes that you found. Include relevant statistics instead of broad general statements. So, you know, you don't want to make broad, you know, 79% had this particular issue. Make sure that you, again, have a limited word count. You highlight the most important things that came out of your study. When you do a longer paper or your poster, you can include more data, but include the most important things in the results. The other thing is to use tables and figures when words are inadequate. But again, keep in mind that the word count is limited. And then do not overstate your findings. One thing that I'll see sometimes is people will sort of make the case that they can fix all the world's problems because of the findings of their study. So you want to make sure you stick to what exactly it is that you found. Keep in mind as I talk about the results and conclusion sections that you won't have these in your course-based abstract because you won't have done the study yet, but just so you know that that's typically what is seen in a scientific abstract. And then the final section is conclusions, and this is when you link your findings back to what is known or the literature or what you found that extends current knowledge. Explain how your work made a realistic difference. What is it that realistically, and it might be one small thing that you found, but that can make a big difference in the scholarly work that you're doing.
So an example from my work that was a conclusion, cardiac biomechanics were related to physical symptoms and anxiety, providing preliminary evidence of the biological underpinnings of symptomatology in adults with heart failure. So people know that you can go forward with this biomarker work and that this does have a role in symptoms. Just some general tips and some things for you to think about. Um, number one, and something that's really important, is review abstracts that have been previously accepted by wherever you're submitting them as exemplars. For example, if you're submitting to a conference, you can look at previous abstracts that have been submitted other years to use as sort of a template for the one that you want to do, knowing what they're looking for. I do know that if you submit to the undergraduate conference at UMass Amherst, you can go online and see abstracts from previous years that you can use as models. A second thing that's very important is to identify someone to review your abstract for content and basic grammar. I generally tend to have someone inside my field look at it for content and make sure that it makes sense and scientifically sound. And then a lot of times I'll have a friend or someone outside of my profession read for basic grammar flow, does it make sense? Because you want to be able to have a lay audience in general understand what you're doing. You will need several drafts, so be sure to start early. It's not an easy process to shrink down to uh, a small number of words. And then the last tip is to delete extra words when you have a tight word count. If you only had 150 words or 200 words, that's very small. And oftentimes words like the, a, and may need to be eliminated from your um, abstract. And so you'll need to make that decision when the time comes if you need to eliminate some of those words when it's getting tight. And I just finished today with an example of an abstract so you can see what it looks like. The reason that I specifically put this slide in is I wanted you to just sort of take note and look at this based on some of the rules and things that I had suggested to you. You'll see that I have all of those categories I described present here. You'll notice that the background is short and my final sentence is sort of saying, however, we don't know certain things. I've identified the gap what the exact purpose is in one direct dense sentence with all the variables and population described. The methods and results sections are the biggest sections of the abstract because again I want people to know exactly how I collected the data and what it is I found that's new and different and then I have my conclusions to sort of make the case why is this important to my field. So this is just an example of an abstract. You can use it as a model to see uh, in this organization, I believe, wanted a 300-word abstract, which is very typical. I think between 150 to 300 words is very often what you'll see. So good luck to all of you, and hope that this is um, helpful.